we have an eminent speaker, uh, Professor Muhammad Nadi from Cairo University, who will give us a lecture about pathophysiology of IBD. Father, Dr. Muhammad. Shukran, Dr. Yusri. Shukran, Dr. Fathallah. Shukran, Dr. Ahmed. The whole organizing committee on the Dawa Karima and the Egyptian League. The Dawati Ba Ism. كلنا بننتظره وكلنا بنستمتع بال بالايفنت و... و... ويعني بنستناه من من السنه للسنه يعني. أه بشكر برضو شركه تاكيده على الدعوه الكريمه واسمحوا لي ان انا ابدا البرزنتيشن. الباثوفيسيولوجي اوف اي بي دي رول اوف انتي انتاجرين ان كرونز ديزيز. الحقيقه احنا يعني اكيد كلنا لاحظنا انه اخر 10 سنين حصل طفره في في الفيد اوف اي بي دي وايد فرايتي اوف درجز ار ان ذا بايب لاين فور بوث السرتيف كولايتس اند كرونز ديزيز بيشنت والحقيقه تشالنج دلوقتي هو هاو تو انتجريت ذا رايت دراج فور ذا رايت بيشنت ات ذا رايت تايم بقى التشالنج مش ان احنا زي زمان ان احنا ما عندناش تشويسز التشالنج دلوقتي بقى ان عندنا تشويسز But I can how to integrate the proper drug in the right time for the right patient. The difference, طبعا ما بين Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. يعني حمر عليها بسرعة. The Crohn's disease, طبعا, can affect any part of the gut. زي ما بنقول دائما from mouth to anus. Usually, it is a transmural inflammation. Complication includes stricture, bowel obstruction, fistulae, perforation, abscesses, and stomatal growth, especially in It, if it affects children, and uh, there is increased risk of cancer. The ulcerative colitis limited to the colon or rectum. The inflammation limited to the mucosa. Complication can include toxic megacolon. Sign significantly increased risk of cancer colon, and surgery is considered curative. Well, I can talk about highly morbid. The pathogenesis. في عندنا ازاي البول بيتحول من نورمال لانفليمد في عندنا كذا فاكتور مش كلهم معروفين لغايه دلوقتي جينيتيك سسبتابيلتي قعدنا فترات طويله نسمع عن النوت 2 كارد 15 على ان هو سسبتابيلتي جين واكتشفنا بعد كده ان هو يعني الفاريشن ما بين النورمال والديزيز بوبيوليشن از ا جينيتيك سسبتابيلتي مش عاليه الانفيرومنتال تريجرز لغايه دلوقتي كلها ثيوريز ميديكيشن انفكشنز والدايت والبوليونز وال كل كل الثيوريز بتاعت الانفيرومنتال رول ما فيش حاجه فاكتور واحد نتجنبه فيمنع الديزيز الالسرتيف كولايتس از كاركترايز زي ما قلنا انفلاميشن اوف ذا كولون الكرونز ديزيز عشان نركز عليه هو باتشي ديزيز ممكن كاركترايز بسكيب ليجنز throughout the whole GI, cobblestone pattern of ulceration, affects all the bowel wall. The complication ulcers, fistula perforations, they have a complication stricture or obstruction or increased bowel risk. The problem is that we are now seeing a lot of people with abdominal pain, tried constipation, with cash of anal fissure, it will be a Crohn's disease. Not all anal fissure and not all fistula are inflammatory bowel disease. للاسف بقى في ابيوز شويه في او اوفر دايجنوزز واوفر استيميشن للانفلاماتوري باول ديزيز وكرونز ديزيز بقى اي بين ودايريه مش مفسره بقت انفلاماتوري باول ديزيز فور بايولوجيك ثيرابي. طيب في فرق بقى في الباترن في الديزيز باترن او ديزيز بيهيفير ما بين الالسرتيف والكولايتس حقيقه انه احنا كنا بنقول دايما انه كرونز ديزيز از ا بروجريسيف ديزيز. والحقيقه دي لغايه دلوقتي حوالي 24% من الكرونز ديزيز بيشنت من كرونز ديزيز بيشنت بيبقى عندهم كرونيك كونتينيوس سيمبتومز مقارنه ب 6% اونلي اوف السرتيف كولايتس اللي بي السيمبتومز بتاعتهم بتبرزست ولكن السرتيف كولايتس يوجوالي اكتر من 55% بيبقى عندهم ديكريز ان انتنسي اوف سيمبتومز اوفر تايم طبعا بنشوف حالات بروجريسيف مع الوقت وبنشوف حالات انترميتنت ولكن الاغلبيه في الالسرتيف ان هو بيديكريز ويذ تايم في حين ان كرونز ديزيز اكثر من 25% كرونيك كونتينيوس سيمبتومز. طيب 
احنا عارفين انه ال ال there is a state of preclinical inflammation قبل ال diagnosis of Crohn's disease وده proven في studies اللي عملها بروفيسور كولومبال في امريكا آه وي آه عرفنا انه في حاجه اسمها preclinical inflammation prior to the diagnosis of Crohn's disease لكن الحقيقه احنا دورنا بيظهر من وقت ال diagnosis وال interference بتاعنا ما بين ال diagnosis وال prevention of complication once حصل complication ودخلنا في ال fistula وال surgery وال strictures ده بيبقى حصل some sort of fibrosis وبيبقى uh, there is an irreversible damage part of an irreversible damage of the bowel عشان كده احنا دايما بنطلب early intervention at the time of diagnosis to prevent a further uh, damage of the gut wall لو عملنا proper intervention at the time of diagnosis early in the disease been prevent the progress of inflammation and the sequelae of such inflammation. الحقيقه احنا عندنا دايما دلوقتي بنتكلم على window of opportunity. The window of opportunity from the time to the of diagnosis early in the disease ليها كذا definition اول سنتين لا من diagnosis ولا من بدايه ظهور ال symptoms فيها debate ولكن دورنا انه to intervene as early as possible to avoid the irreversible damage of the gut. Muhammad, uh, would you okay. keep uh, uh, on English? Okay. Uh, some of the viewers are asking us to speak in English. Okay. So, how uh, would you identify the patient who will benefit from early of biologic? Is every patient a candidate for early intervention with biologic? No, you have a predictor of severity, you have a predictor of poor outcome of the disease. For Crohn's disease, this is an early onset. So patients who are diagnosed with Crohn's disease early in, the, uh, in, uh, early in their age are uh, at a higher risk of poor outcome, severe endoscopic lesions on endoscopic uh, evaluation, lack of mucosal healing after induction of clinical remission, either with steroids or with immune suppression, extensive disease, need for corticosteroid early in the course of the treatment and smoking. All these are predictor of poor uh, disease or poor outcome, so you have to intervene early with biologic or you see the need for frequent courses of steroids and the presence of pancreas. There are other criteria like CRP, high health, uh, fecal calprotectin, low albumin, high CRP, but these are the main predictors of disease progression. We always hear about clinical remission, clinical response, deep remission. And we don't understand what is the important and what is the impact of such goals. If we achieve such goals, how it will reflect on the uh, patient's life. So if you achieve a clinical response, you will improve the symptoms for the patient, but the outcome will be improved the quality of life. If you achieve a higher goal, which is the remission of the disease, there will be no symptoms and no labs, no evidence, no laboratory evidence of inflammation. So the outcome will be decreased hospitalization. This is a very good outcome. If you achieve deep remission, you will have normal endoscopy, mucosal healing. And if you, of course, if you can achieve histological uh, remission also, that will be a better goal. And at that point only, you will avoid your patient of surgery and you will not have any disability. That's why when you are putting a primary endpoint or a secondary endpoint in a research or in a paper or testing a drug, you have to know how it will affect the outcome uh, in your patient. We are always asked about how to choose the first biologic and how you choose your biologic. There is no clear answer and there is no single factor you can choose upon it uh, the, the first biologic or which biologic to start with. But you have drug factors. Of course, we, we have now a very long uh, back record of anti-TNF as biologics and they have good safety and good uh, price in the market. But you have me uh, mucosal healing, fistula healing, favorable safety profile, durability of remission, immunogenicity, rapid induction of remission, all these are drag factors. There is patient factors that the same drug will not work uh, in the same patient uh, and another patient with the same efficacy. You have the mode of administration, the ease of use and cost, the patient living beside the hospital is not like a patient who, is, who will be uh, coming uh, in one hour or two hours to receive a 
uh, and uh, IV infusion, work, travel, time spent on treatment, patient clinical factors at initiation, the active disease, pregnancy, presence of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, adverse events, age comorbidity, toler uh, to uh, tolerability of the disease, steroid refractory, in the physician factors, of course. So there is a lot, a lot of factors that come into the decision of choosing a biologic. No single factor upon which you can make and you can choose your first biologic. For NTTNF, we have been using NTTNF since 1992 and 1993. We have a very long back record. They have been used in also in rheumatological disease and other diseases. They are safe, they are well tolerated, their price is affordable, but however, their efficacy is very limited. We know that only around 60% will have a first uh, response, uh, will be a first responder to uh, uh, NTTNF. And as time goes, there will be secondary non-responder. We will lose around 20% every year uh, uh, with uh, every year of patients who already responded. So you have only around 60% who respond to NTTNF and every year, every year you will lose to around 20% of those who responded to NTTNF. That's why I always tend to ask the question, who knows a patient that have been on a remission with NTTNF more than five years. And I never get a response for that question. Who had a long-term response with NTTNF? NTTNF are very good, they are very effective, they are very quick, they act quickly, and they're very tolerate, well tolerated and affordable, but the problem is a very low uh, first response, uh, a very low rate of first response, and the loss of patient uh, uh, as secondary non-responder uh, with time. So what about inflammation cascade? The immune system is uh, the largest accumulation uh, in the intestine, in the gut, is the largest accumulation of lymphoid tissue in the body. Innate and adaptive immune response uh, mechanism protects the intestinal tract from pathogenic attack. And we know that in our mouth, in, in, in our stomach, in, the, in our colon are very high colonization of uh, microbiomes and bacteria. Inflammatory bowel disease is a result of inappropriate activation of the mucosa immune system of the gut. And understanding of the immune system help us, help us to understand the mechanism of action of drugs that may deal this immune response. So we are having the lumen, we are having the epithelium that protects bacteria to, transfer, to be translocated from the lumen, from the gut lumen to the blood. And this protective barrier is very complex and very complicated. You have the mucosal barrier and mucin is very uh, protective barrier from migration of bacteria. You have the tight junction between the epithelial cells. You have immune cells in the lamina propria like the dendritic cells which can sense any pathogen in the uh, uh, any pathogen in the lumen that and uh, once once activated it will activate lymphocytes and macrophages to initiate an immune response. So if there is a break in the epithelial barrier and in the uh, gut uh, gut lumen barrier, uh, the antigen presenting cells will present the microbiome, the lipo lipoprotein polysaccharide to initiate and, uh, and uh, uh, stimulate the CD4 T cells that will uh, differentiate into two types of T helper cells, TH1 and TH2, that will uh, start the release of cytokine, pro-inflammatory cytokines, of course. And also there, is, there will be a down regulation of T regulatory cells, which are the protective cells that uh, decrease the, inhib the uh, perpetuation of inflammation. I will go quickly because I have a more important slide. The uh, lymphocyte trafficking, how the lymphocytes are recruited to the gut lumen. They allow the capture and the entry of activated lymphocytes in the intestinal tissue. Uh, it is uh, interfering with uh, lymphocyte trafficking, offers a potential therapeutic target to treat inflammatory bowel disease. The main uh, proteins that act through activation of lymphocytes to adhere to the vessel lumen and to migrate what we call lymphocyte homing are selectines, chemokine-like integrins, 
and adrenaline on the blood vessels. All these proteins act through uh, integrin to attach lymphocytes to the uh, blood vessel and increase lymphocyte migration to the site of inflammation. The MACCAM alpha-4 beta-7 interaction mediates intestinal lymphocyte trafficking through uh, uh, adhesion to the lymphocytes. I will show you a video here, like you see, that shows the steps of homing or uh, trafficking of lymphocytes. So there is capture, rolling, leukocyte activation, then firm adhesion with the adhesion molecules, the VCAM, the ICAM, the VACCAM, and then a migration to the site of inflammation. What we do with uh, new drugs like vidolizumab, that it will block the alpha-4, beta-7, and it will prevent the adhesion of lymphocytes to the, and prevent the migration, as you will see. The anti-alpha-4 agent will block the receptors on the lymphocytes, so it will prevent the adhesion, the firm adhesion between leukocytes and the endothelium, and so there will be no migration to uh, the site of inflammation. That's how we affect the immune pathway. So what about in, uh, vidolizumab or Intivio in anti-TNF therapy? Uh, Intivio was presented first as a treatment for ulcerative colitis, which was compared to uh, anti-TNF. As we know that uh, adalimumab is okay, he's doing a good job for, uh, for ulcerative colitis patient, but let's see how uh, vidolizumab have shown uh, an efficacy, and this efficacy through induction therapy only in six weeks can be noted in both in anti-TNF naive patient as well as for anti-TNF exposed patient. Of course, in all our slides and every time we present, we'll say that the response of any new biologic therapy will be better for anti-TNF naive patient uh, more than anti-TNF exposed patient because they are very hard to treat, their, or their immune system is already have been um, modulated several times. So if you want to act more and in a better way, you have to select the better molecule for your patient from the beginning and not to waste time and effort and uh, uh, finance on a molecule that, that you know that it will not be as effective. For Crohn's disease, vidolizumab was uh, have shown an induction efficacy at week six compared to placebo. And again, if we select the anti-TNF failure population, uh, there is a high significant difference between at week six and these are patient hard to treat. Uh, in anti-TNF failure population, there is a higher uh, response rate compared to placebo. And in the overall population, if you can see up to 40% of the patient, around uh, half of the patient uh, of CD patient responded only at week 10 to vidolizumab. And this is by Crohn's disease activity index. Uh, Vidolizumab demonstrated early symptomatic improvement. The patient cares more not about his CRP and not about his hemoglobin. He is caring about stool frequency and abdominal pain. And for uh, entity and F naive patient, if you can see the difference, Vidolizumab was effective. There was um, a remarkable decrease of the uh, both the stool frequency and the abdominal pain scoring evaluation, and also. Uh, for entity and FX post patient, of course, it was less, but still, uh, vidolizumab was uh, as effective. If you want to compare two molecules, you will go and read uh, the papers that compare uh, results of two, uh, those two mo molecules. But you have to go into the details. When uh, you, uh, you read a paper, you have to take account the prior entity and F percent of, patient, of patients included in this trial. So, for, for example, the Love CD Vidolizumab trial included up to 88% of prior entity and F patients. As we said, the patient with very hard, uh, who are very hard uh, to treat because they're pri priorly exposed to, uh, to uh, other uh, biologic therapy. So, in the extent therapy, we uh, have uh, shown that entity and F therapy was adalimumab induced mucosal healing. Vidolizumab uh, in the Versify trial 
uh, induced endoscopic remission and the response and complete mucosal healing at week 26. So in the overall population, there was endoscopic remission uh, uh, to uh, vidolizumab for patients who received, for CD patients who received vidolizumab, and there was a percent of patients that had endoscopic response and complete mucosal healing. Result uh, of video, for vidrozumab according to different criteria of mucosal healing, complete mucosal healing occurred in the Versify trial and complete mucosal healing according to the ulcer, ulcer size and CSCD score also was uh, uh, remarkable. Endoscopic remission rate by baseline disease duration in uh, the study population, higher endoscopic uh, remission rates with shorter disease duration, of course, the shorter the disease duration, the higher the endoscopic remission rate because there, is, there will be, as we said, there will be less sequelae of inflammation on the long term. What about efficacy by prior NTTNF therapy? And that is a very important question we have been asked for here. What if my patient received NTTNF? Will it affect its response to videolizumab? Adalimumab, as we said, is effective for CD, but vidrozumab has uh, shown reduced efficacy in anti-TNF exposed patients. Yes, if, you, if your patient had prior uh, anti-TNF, the response will be less than if he's anti-TNF naive. So you will get the best response. Again, clinical remission maintained at one year, around 50%. Uh, had uh, uh, a clinical remission, clinical remission, and not only clinical response. Clinical remission means that the disease is in quiescent state. Up to 50% of the patient who received the videolizumab were maintained at a clinical remission at week 52, compared to only around one third of the patient who were priorly exposed to anti-TNF. So it's better if you want to get the best results to get the best molecule from the beginning. What about efficacy by prior videolizumab therapy? If my patient received videolizumab and he didn't respond, what to do? You are stuck in a difficult situation. No, you are not. Because here is a study that compared patients who received anti-TNF after videolizumab and patients who received anti-TNF after another anti-TNF. And the result showed that a second line anti-TNF effectiveness in ulcerative colitis is not effective whether the first drug was anti-TNF or vidolizumab. This was the same for CD patient. Uh, patient who received vidolizumab were as good as anti-TNF. If they fail the first line, they can go safely to another line, to a second line anti-TNF. Results suggest that first-line vidrozumab may not impact the effectiveness of subsequent anti-TNF treatment in real-world uh, real uh, clinical practice. So what about comparative studies of first-line use of biologic? We know that for UC, vidrozumab can have a high treatment persistence. The patient will maintain the response for a longer period, no need for dose escalation. Clinical response is, uh, is, uh, is better than uh, anti-TNF, clinical remission is maintained and mucosal healing is attained. What about CD? Same results have been shown in a, a study with 420 patients, CD patients, and it, it showed that uh, treatment persistence uh, for fidelizumab was, uh, was uh, more than anti-TNF, no need for dose escalation, clinical response was the same, clinical remission was the same, and mucosal healing also was the same. So these studies favors vidrolizumab to anti-TNF. Vidrolizumab is superior to adalimumab, and that was the first head-to-head -head study, the first uh, trial to compare a new biologic from the second generation to anti-TNF from the first generation. And of course, the overall uh, uh, analysis showed that vidrolizumab was uh, more effective, more patient attained the primary to the clinical remission and clinical response to uh, compared to adalimumab as anti-TNF. Higher rates of endoscopic improvement were achieved with ridulizumab compared to adalimumab in overall and in anti-TNF naive population at one year. What about maintaining the 
remission, maintaining the quiescence of the disease, difference in clinical remission between vidurizumab and uh, dalimumab were maintained. So not only you have a good response and early response only at week 10, no, but you can maintain the response. The difference in the response will be maintained through time and up to one year, there is a difference in the uh, maintenance of the clinical remission. Symptom control and risk of malignancy. Of course, we know that vidalizumab being gut selective is very safe. The risk of malignancy is very uh, limited. Uh, and especially for patients with prior malignancy, I think vidalizumab will be the safest choice if the patient has, for example, I had a patient who had prior uh, lymphoma and was cured of the lymphoma and he's having a mild and uh, a moderate form of uh, UC and the best choice for him, uh, uh, of course, after consultation of his oncologist was uh, vidalizumab. By naive patients treated with uh, vidalizumab were significantly had significantly serious adverse events and uh, serious infections compared to uh, anti TNF. And the it's very, it's very important point when you have a patient, a young patient who is uh, afraid of the side effects of the malignancies of the combination with immuran, because uh, a, a, a child or a, a kid of 14 years or 15 years old who, you, who wants to start a biologic, you will have to evaluate if you want to maintain that patient on immuran for 20 years, I think it's, it will be safer to go to a new biologic like vidalizumab to avoid the use of concomitant uh, immune modulator. Symptom control and risk, and risk malignancy are similar importance to as in patients with UC and safety outcome. And uh, the, the, the serious adverse events and serious infection number uh, is very limited, and uh, each case is studied, and there is no increase in the risk of uh, serious infections with vidalizumab. Efficacy with five years of continuous vidalizumab up to 90% of patients were in remission after around five years, and 95% had clinical response after five years. Thank you, and this is the end of my presentation. Thank you.